Hello YouTubers and welcome back to JK Lenses review of the Nikon 200-400 f4 VR1 lens. Thanks for your patience in waiting for this, the second instalment of this review. When we left the action we were looking at the accessories which are supplied with the lens and those which you might need to buy in order to use it properly. As mentioned in a previous section, this lens does not come with a lens cap. Only a drawstring bag which fits over the end of the lens and it's not possible to buy a lens cap from Nikon uh, to go on the end of the lens. Partly because my second hand version didn't even have the little drawstring bag to go over the end of the lens and partly because I like a nice hard piece of plastic on the end of my lens to protect it, I invested in one of the Donzec lens caps. The Donzec company in America make lens caps for all the large telephoto lenses made by Nikon and by Canon. The one shown here is the N50 model, which fits all versions of the Nikon 200-400 f4 lens. The cap is a simple push-fit design with little O-rings inside the rim to ensure a secure fit. It's made of very strong plastic and provides a good fit and good protection for the end of the lens. I'm certainly a lot happier having this strong and well-made piece of plastic protecting the front of this expensive lens. The one downside of this item for people in the UK is that they don't appear to have a UK stockist. However, the good news is they're small and light items and relatively letterbox friendly, and mine certainly arrived from the USA very promptly indeed. You can find out more details about these excellent lens caps at www.donzeclenscap.com. In common with Nikon's long telephoto prime lenses, this lens comes supplied with its own custom made backpack. This bag accommodates the 200 to 400 mm lens with a pro body is extremely well made and provides excellent protection for the lens and the body. With its single strap design this bag provides an excellent way of carrying the lens with you when you're walking around. The build quality of this bag is extremely high and when zipped up it provides a pretty much weatherproof compartment for the lens and one body. In use I have to admit to finding this bag a bit of a mixed blessing. Apart from a couple of stretchy pockets on the outside there's no facility to take almost anything else apart from the lens and a pro body in the bag. If you need to take another body or other lenses along with this lens then the Pro Trekker series of bags by Low Pro will allow you to do this but obviously that's another additional cost. Although it's hard to fault this bag as a solution for walking around I often have to cycle to locations and I find the single strap design on a bicycle is far from ideal. If you're driving to your locations and then walking a short distance I guess these concerns will be less of an issue for you. When this lens is attached to a body like the D3, there's a combined weight of over 4.5 kilograms. This means that any review of this lens can't be complete without considering the kind of support that you might use with it. Although it's quite possible to spend a great deal of money on mounts designed to get the very best out of this lens, we'll also consider some of the more economical options. If you're experienced in using fast aperture long telephoto lenses, then you may already be clear what kind of support system you'd use with this lens, in which case feel free to skip this section. However, if you've never owned a lens of this size before, you may be about to find out that it will cheerfully squash any tripod that you've used with an ordinary lens, in which case this section might contain some useful advice. First of all, there are basically three ways of supporting this or any other lens. Firstly, you can use your own legs, which is obviously for hand holding. You could use a monopod, or of course you could use a tripod. It is possible to get good results from this lens handheld, and Nikon provide the VR system to help with this. However, this is obviously not the way to get the very best out of the lens, and can only really be done for short periods of time before it becomes extremely tiring. If you need to get high quality results from this lens, and you need to shoot for fairly long periods of time in a position where you're not able to use a tripod, then a monopod, and your legs obviously, provide a good compromise. Sports photographers working on the touchline often use this system as it provides some of the support of a tripod while allowing you to move yourself and your equipment around as quickly. Nevertheless, if you want to get the very best out of this lens, then a tripod is probably the best solution in terms of support. Having decided whether to go hand-holding, monopod or tripod, the next decision is what kind of mount to use. A lens of this size and weight means that you need to think more carefully than normal about the mount that you're using in particular about its stability. So it's probably worth for just a moment thinking a bit about the physics of stability. In the words of many great videos, here comes the science bit. There are basically two types of stability. Objects can be either stable or unstable. 
A good way of thinking about this is to think about a cone resting on the floor. If the cone's resting on its point, then it could, in theory at least, stay in that position. However, if it's disturbed even slightly, it'll obviously fall over. This is known as unstable equilibrium for obvious reasons. Compare that with a cone resting on its base, a bit like a traffic cone for example. The cone will obviously stay in that position perfectly happily and, if it's pushed slightly to the side, it'll naturally return to its original position. This is called stable equilibrium. Now, let's have a look at a few popular types of lens mount to see which ones are stable and which ones are unstable. With a lens of this size, it's obviously essential to get one which is stable. We'll have a look at a monopod mount, a ball head mount, a pan and tilt head mount, and a large lens mount. Placing this lens on a basic monopod mount results in an arrangement which behaves almost exactly like a cone resting on its point and is extremely unstable. This is obviously not a good idea. Placing the lens on a ball head mount results in a similarly unstable arrangement. When locked in position, this ball head can hold the camera and lens arrangement steady enough to take photographs. However, once the ball head is unlocked, the whole arrangement is extremely unstable as you can see. Moving up to a pan and tilt head, we start to see some behaviour which is characteristic of stable rather than unstable equilibrium. For instance, when the panning control is unlocked, the camera and lens doesn't actually come crashing to the ground and stays in relatively stable equilibrium. Unfortunately, unlocking the roll or the tilt controls once again shows the mount in unstable equilibrium, with the weight of the camera and the lens easily overcoming the friction built into these two controls. It's only when the camera and lens are fitted on a gimbal design of mount, such as the 393 by Manfrotto shown here, that we start to see uniformly stable behaviour, reminiscent of a cone on its base, rather than a cone on its point. The upshot of all these experiments is that if you're serious about using this lens, you're going to need to invest in some kind of gimbal head, which is designed specifically for holding a large lens like this. Very effective gimbal heads which work well with this lens are made by Really Right Stuff and by Wimbley. However, they're both very expensive, each costing a significant fraction of the original cost of the lens itself. Nevertheless, if you're going to be using this lens a lot and want to get the very best out of it, they really are the only way to go. However, a very cost-effective compromise which I've found is the Manfrotto 393 monopod gimbal head. This mount calls itself a monopod head and can be fitted very effectively to a monopod, but I use it quite a lot as a tripod mount. As you can see, it allows full movement of the lens in all directions, and keeps the whole thing very stable. It's also a fraction of the cost of the really right stuff or Wimbley heads. As somebody who often has to travel as lightly as possible, a good compromise which I've found is to use the Manfrotto 393 gimbal head with the Manfrotto 190 CX3 carbon fibre tripod. As you can see, they provide an effective mount and support for the lens, and their combined weight and price isn't too bad. In use, this arrangement does feel a little bit top heavy, but it's a price I'm prepared to pay for not having to drag a heavy tripod around with me. When I'm not travelling too far and weight isn't an issue, I use the Manfrotto 055 Pro B tripod. The fact that this tripod weighs nearly half the weight of the camera and the lens makes this a bit more of a fair fight in terms of stability. My feeling is that tripods of the standard of these two designs from Manfrotto represent about the minimum that you'd want to use with this lens. Although one can obviously spend a great deal more, anything less than these two designs will probably be crushed under the weight of the camera and lens. The bottom line with this lens is, if you're intending to buy one and to use one, then you're going to have to spend some money on a support system. Like most of Nikon's professional lenses, the build quality of this lens is about the highest that there is. The body of the lens is clearly carved out of a single block of kryptonite forged in the centre of the sun. This makes for a lens body which is extremely strong and is matched by a very high standard of weather sealing. This makes for a lens which can fend off everyday knocks and bumps and I've regularly used it outside in very poor weather for prolonged periods without any problems. For a camera and lens combination that weighs over 45 kilograms and is nearly half a metre long, this lens when combined with a pro body is remarkably well balanced. Its weight is fairly evenly distributed and it certainly can be used handheld. Although as explained in the previous section, this probably shouldn't be plan A. Rather surprisingly for a lens of this focal length, it's able to focus down to a minimum focus of 2 metres. This very useful feature does mean that the focusing mechanism has quite a long way to travel. 
Although it's an AFS lens using one of Nikon's speedy silent wave motors, the time it takes the autofocus system to travel from one end to the other could be a little slow for some applications. Perhaps with this in mind, Nick would have included a very handy focus limiting switch. With this feature engaged, the focusing system only has to hunt from 6 meters to infinity when looking for focus, and this speeds things up dramatically. I'm sure many photographers may spend most of their photographic lives at focal lengths below 200, so it's probably worth having a look at what the 200 to 400 mm focal length range actually means in practice. To help us with this section, here's a chunk of lovely English countryside. To make the comparison a bit more meaningful, and to give you a sense of what it was like to actually be there, this photograph was taken with the excellent Nikon 50mm f1.4 lens. In addition, all the photographs in this section are JPEGs straight out of the camera, in this case a Nikon D3S, with no post-processing. Swapping the lens for the Nikon 200-400 f4 and zooming to 200mm, its widest setting, changes the view to this. One of the first things that you might notice is the difference in colour temperature between the two lenses. Compared to most of my other Nikon lenses, the 200-400 gives a significantly bluer or higher colour temperature in its images. Pictures being prepared for publication from this lens nearly always involve a slight tweaking of the white balance. If we carry on zooming, following the markings on the lens itself, we go to 250mm, 300mm, 350mm and finally 400mm. The obvious point to make from this series of photographs is that even at its widest setting of 200mm this lens is zoomed in way beyond the objects in your immediate vicinity. Almost anything in the field in front of the photographer would be too close to be photographed very successfully with this lens and it makes a major feature out of a very small part of the 50mm view, i.e. the bridge in the centre of the picture. In other words, the main raison d'etre for this lens is to photograph things that you can't easily approach. Replace the bridge in the centre of this picture with a line or a Formula One car and you kind of see where this lens is coming from. It's not too surprising then to see that this lens is very popular amongst sports, wildlife and surveillance photographers. Perhaps a better example of photographing things that can't easily be approached is my bit of industrial espionage on next door's television aerial. It's a hardly noticeable minor feature of a photograph taken at 50mm, but at 200mm takes centre stage. And when zoomed into 400mm, the quality of this lens means it's almost possible to read the serial number. In terms of the performance of the lens, I'd say there are basically four headlines. Firstly, I don't find the fact that this lens is an f4 rather than an f2.8 any kind of real limitation. Its ability to isolate subjects and its light grasp have always been more than adequate for the kind of subjects that I shoot. This is perhaps linked to the second feature of the lens's performance. Pretty much uniquely amongst all the Nikon lenses that I've owned, this lens really does give its best performance wide open. Almost every aspect of the lens's optical quality is at its best or close to it at f4. It really is hard to believe until you've actually owned one of these lenses, but stopping down a little bit from f4 to try and ensure maximum quality really is a bit of a waste of time. I imagine this feature probably was part of the design brief for this lens at Nikon in order to make sure that it remained competitive with the f2.8 lenses and almost all the shots that you'll see in this section were taken wide open at f4. The third feature of this lens's optical performance, as you probably can't see due to the YouTube compression, is that it offers pretty much the same optical quality as Nikon's prime lenses in this region. There are several head-to-head -head reviews on the web, but all these seem to do is to document very tiny differences. Once again, this was probably part of the design brief for this lens to ensure that it was competitive, but if you're worried about the compromises which buying this zoom lens may give over the prime lenses, then optical quality in most real-life situations isn't one of them. Finally, the autofocus speed of this lens is very good, particularly with the focus limiter engaged. The 300 and 400 f2.8 primes are faster, but as you can see, this lens is able to keep up with Superbikes and Lewis Hamilton 